By the way, there was a pasty, but you could still see some nipple. That's the update. Areola or nipple? Areola's for the streets. Everybody <laughs> should get areola. You're seeing a little bit of both. Oh. Come on now. 100%. <laughs> this episode of Two Bears, One Cave is brought to you by Blue Chew. It's summer, camping season. Let's all talk about pitching tents. That's right. This episode is sponsored by our friends at Blue Chew. And when we say pitching tents, we're talking about your dick getting all hard. Blue Chew is a unique online service that delivers the same active ingredients as Viagra and Cialis, but in chewable tablets and at a fraction of the cost. You can take them anytime, day or night, so you can plan ahead or be ready whenever an opportunity arises. The process is simple. Sign up at BlueChew.com, consult with one of their licensed medical providers, and once you're approved, you'll receive your prescription within days. The best part, it's all done online. Who doesn't want to do that? So if you could benefit from extra confidence when it's time to perform, Blue Chew can help. And we've got a special deal for our listeners. Try Blue Chew free when you use our promo code BEARS at checkout. Just pay $5 shipping. That's bluechew.com promo code BEARS to receive your first month free. Visit bluechew.com for more details and important safety information. And we thank Blue Chew for sponsoring this podcast. It is so much better to do this podcast without the regular co-hosts. I'm so excited to get a chance to chat more with one of my favorites, Roy Wood Jr. Uh, Roy, thank you very much for coming on today. I, um, I had such a, a laugh with you when we, um, we jumped in on it. was like a fundraiser thing. I forget what it was. I think it was a fundraiser, was the, right? Was it the Patrice O'Neill thing? Or it might no, have been some I thought it was shit. Or... Yeah, I thought it was like fundraising. Oh no, it was like some for the comedians and yes, comedy and laughing comedy club, comedy club waitstaffs and all of that. That's shit. right for the waitstaffs when the pandemic like really took off and we we're trying to raise money for um for the waitstaff. We did a thing together and you had me howling. I was like, I gotta to try to podcast with this dude again because I obviously you know, knew who you knew who you are and stuff, but I didn't really get a chance to chat with you except for in that. And um, now we're, we're via zoom again. We're still not did, in the same Did room. I ever say it to you or did I tweet it to you or did I, I, I can't remember, but I remember when your last Netflix special came out and the clever way you swerved around the N word, Yes, you messaged me. I can't remember what the joke was, but I was like, that was fucking good. Yeah. That yeah, you messaged good. me that. Like, I, was I was like, like yeah. <laughs> like that, like I was sending that one around to my dogs. I was like, yeah. yo, man, y'all got this fucking white boy. <laughs> <laughs> this shit was good. Thanks, <laughs> like, man. That's that I mean, is high there praise. Have been, there have been white comics that have said it where it made sense in the context of the joke and it was fine yeah. for yeah. me. Yeah. I can only speak for myself. I can't speak for all African Americans. But yeah. That was even more clever because you didn't say it and you yeah. figured out a way around. I was like, okay, that was, yeah. that was fucking, but my point Thank is you, you've man. always been one of my favorites, man. So I appreciate it. Thank you, you man. Thank you very much. Um, to fill in. Before, before we uh, uh, keep chatting, I wanted to, to mention that you have a, a new podcast, right? Um, that's out. Um, is it new? Yeah. So it's, well, yeah. So it's Roy's job fair where we, People come on and tell shitty employment stories. And we also have people that are hiring in weird industries. And uh-huh. we talk to them. And then also the Daily Show. Uh, we do one called Beyond the Scenes where I talk with writers and other correspondents. Just tell me about that time you almost got punched in the face in 2015. Yeah, dude. I, the I'm, that's some of my, those are, I mean, those stories I think appeal. Bad job stories or, or anything in the workplace that went sideways. I could listen to stories like that forever. So if that's the podcast, I'm fucking in. Bro, we talked with a dude from the Postal Service, and I never thought about this. Did you know that the crack house still gets mail on a regular basis? <laughs> no, like I did in not. The hood, I didn't think about there's that. mail. Yeah, yeah. It's, it's still someone yeah. is... It's a residence. It's a, yeah, it's still a residence. It's still a legal residence, so you have to yeah. every day go up on the porch and, and sometimes certified letters, and you have to deliver certified letters to crack houses. And we had a post a dude from the post office like breaking that shit down for us, and it's just the nuance of certain jobs that you wouldn't even you know think about and stuff like that. And well, think about. I, spoke- I mean, that's got to be. We don't really think about how terrified uh, a postal worker could be delivering a letter in in all kinds of neighborhoods but like 
if it's a house like that where you're like, man, it's sketchy as fuck. You know what's going on here. You don't know who's going to answer. You don't know what's going on there. I mean, that that's also a terrifying experience. But then also by the same hand, he's also responsible for delivering like medication to people. Like there's a lot of people right? who don't even go to the pharmacy. Like yeah, your health plan is so fucked that you have to wait on a dude named Charles to bring you whatever the fuck pill is going to keep you alive. Oh my so God. You're also in charge of that. But then oh because God. people know that you're delivering pills, they don't know what the pills are. Some motherfuckers want to beat you over the goddamn head because they think you're That's delivering right. Xanax and perk. Yeah. And you're not. It's fucking no. diabetic metformin pills. Yeah. It, and so they're like, I'm just going to eat these anyway because it's a pill. I want Yeah, pills. so when the pandemic happened and all the shit shut down and you're on whatever pill you need to keep you alive, it's fucking Charles. Yeah. Dodging you've dogs had, and shit. You've had weird jobs, I bet, right? Have you had like some strange ones? Yeah. I did mostly restaurant work until I got into stand up and then I started doing daily work, daily pay. Like, I don't know. I, I feel like I had like a different stand up journey. Like my day up system was like all of the South and the Midwest. Mm -hmm. So it was, you weren't on a scene and you couldn't have a regular day job. Yeah. I would do like temp service. So like back in those days when you remember when comedy clubs used to be open five days a week. Yeah. And yeah. We were rolling in the dough way back then. Yeah. I would get into town Tuesday night and then I would wake up Wednesday morning and every day, Wednesday through Sunday, I just went to a temp service and just fucking did regular weird shit. I did um, the little stop sticks out on the road, the stop and slow, that little flip stick with the orange vest. Mm -hmm. That mm -hmm. was me. Um, I, I was the guy who came in and we did a deep cleaning of an Outback Steakhouse on a Friday night. Like, and that, was that a so weekly filthy. thing they had done? Yeah, a weekly thing. It's so filthy that you wouldn't even let your employees do it. They oh, call in a separate no. company. And you come in with a pressure washer with like 140 degree water. Oh and my you're God. just fucking just cleaning all of the gunk and grease and the, the fucking hood and all of that shit. Um, I feel sick the, right now. For me, the thing with jobs was that like I just really look back at all of the people I met. I think I think what we forget about is that as a teenager, that's your first introduction to other adults who yeah. don't govern you. Yeah. You know, every adult in your life is go here, sit there, coach, teacher, fucking church. Like it's all people with some control. Whereas I just wash dishes. I'm 16 and I just wash dishes with this motherfucker named Tony and he cussed me the fuck out. And then like a switch flipped in my head. I go, Oh, I can cuss him back. Yeah. Fuck yeah. Fuck you, Tony. I, like, <laughs> yeah, I mean, it was my fault, though. I got him, uh, uh, knowing what I know now, I almost got him arrested. So I understand why he fucking, oh. he, <laughs> so I used to work in a, a rehab hospital okay. in Birmingham, like Birmingham backstory, um, real big sports medicine right. city. Like you guys most have. Athletes um, there's a there's a guy there. I remember reading Sports Illustrated as a kid, and yeah, they're Dr. like James Andrews. So if someone tore their ACL or something, they would He's go the there, guy. right? Yeah. He's the guy. And so the hospital where everybody goes after you have whatever your sports surgery is was this Health South Rehab Hospital over on Lakeshore. And so I was a food porter. So I was the guy who I worked in the cafeteria basically, but we were the people who put the food trays on the cart and took them to the floors. And then the nurses would deliver the trays. We'd come back in an hour and we would go room to room and mm -hmm. take the, the fucking, we'd bust all of the fucking rooms, right? Behind us, as we're taking all of the food trays out of the room, is the pill cart. So as we're taking food out of a room, a nurse is coming behind us with whatever pills that that particular patient is on. Tony knew this. And so Tony's move was to deliberately leave something in the room that he had to come back and get. Okay. Cause he knew based on like, this is a smart motherfucker, bro. Yeah. He, he knew based on the surgery and the age of the patient, what the 
milligram prescription would be and shit like that. Like if it was like, yes. like for example, Vladi Divac was in our hospital at one time. Troy Aikman as well. Mm-hmm. Like you really can't get in the athlete's room and the athlete is so rigid. But you know the fucking seven-year-old who broke her hip, who just had a hip replacement, she's in pain. Mm -hmm. So you know that dosage is going to be fucking high. And you know right after she eats, she ain't taking the pill right away. It's going to fucking sit there next to that stupid pink water pitcher. So Tony would come back in. Oh, I forgot the napkins. Let me, oh. And he would fucking come back in and get the fucking pills. He would like, if you had two pills, he would take one. Okay. So And would he pop it right away or just want to leave with it? No, he's selling them. He's selling them back in the hood for 20 a pop. So. You know, we're doing like four floors, 60 rooms a floor. So even if you got 20 pills a floor, that's a good fucking lick. And this is before yeah. they were counting the pills and like the right. way the hospital is set up now. It's all now fucking, they scan everything. And yeah, it's yeah. Nino Brown, New Jack City slit yeah. through the door. The pill comes out the fucking tray for it. Like, but in those days, it was just a cart full of fucking Vicodin. Yeah. Help yourself. Help yourself. And so. So I'm supposed to go collect the trays. After you collect the trays, you go bust them back in the fucking dish room. You break down the trays. That is a two-man job. You have to have the trays completed in time for them to make the meals for the next round for the other wing of the fucking hospital. I'm breaking down by myself. I'm behind. My supervisor comes into me and he goes, what the fuck? Where the fuck are the trays? We got to get the trays. We got to set up. It's time to start the line. We got to fucking do the food. Where's Tony? And I just went, I don't know. What I should have said was bathroom or something that covered for him a little bit more. Okay. My supervisor went floor to floor looking for Tony. And when you have a pocket (laughs) full of Vicodin. Yeah. And perk. Yeah. Your supervisor is not who you want to run into Uh -uh. on the floor. And he's like, what are you doing? And Tony's walking back with all of these forks and cups and shit just loose in his hand that people have been slobbering on and shit. Uh-huh. And he comes back in the dish room. The supervisor's like, where were you? I had to go get the rest of this motherfucking, these dishes, because this little dumb motherfucker was leaving shit in the rooms. I got ridden up. You got ridden up. <laughs> I got ridden up. Man, Tony Tony, Because Tony had to cover for me. Supervisor yeah. walked off. Tony grabbed me by the fucking neck and put my face right up against that hot ass dishwasher. Whoa. Motherfucker, you stay out of a motherfucker grown man's business. And to his credit, it was a very fair lesson. Yeah. It was a very fair lesson. I Looking would, back, don't. you go, I, you wish you, would you have just covered for him? Oh, he's in the bathroom right now? I, yeah, yeah. Because even if he wasn't still in pills, I'm still fucking up this dude's employment. Yeah. And, you know, this is the type of motherfucker. He's on probation, so you need this job to keep your freedom, like that type of shit, right? Yeah. So me doing anything that could get him in trouble, je- literally, I'm jeopardizing his freedom. He's jeopardizing his own fucking freedom. Right, right. Can I tell you, though, because I think about something a lot that, that you just said. I'm really against the idea of, um, like going after people's employment when you don't like them or what they say like this this thing today where it's like this guy fucking you know tweeted this or he put this on a podcast and then everybody goes let's uh let's attack his job like let's make sure is he loses his job i'm like fucking is these are the type of people that work there yeah I'm like, um, what <laughs> do you want him you, you want him to be on the streets like you you want uh him to not be able to support a family i just fuck it it makes me crazy to me, it, really it depends does. on the job. Well, yeah, I guess. It dep- I mean, I, I, I'm with you depending on the job. Mm. If you're a shitty fast food worker yeah. and you're a piece of shit, fuck it. I'm coming for your, for your visor. Yeah. I'm going to have your visor. Because I know you can get another one of these shit jobs. I'm sure. just Basically, I'm inconveniencing you for two weeks. But if you're like the professor of studies of whatever the fuck, and it's some job that takes fucking months to get, then all right, let's figure out exactly what did you do because yeah what did you problem, do with- but see that's the problem though lt is that there's no at least as flawed as the criminal justice system is 
Yeah. They have sentencing guidelines. Right. So there's rules. There's a maximum and minimum that you can do to someone. And there's people on the Internet, though, that will always go for the maximum sentence. True. No matter what, because they think vengeance is going to bring them joy and it never will. Like it's it's like it's like, OK, like there was a guy early in the pandemic who got bad service at a Chipotle or I don't know, whatever mm-hmm. it was. He made a racist joke at a lady or some shit. And in the internet, fucking killer bees came for him and attacked yeah. his job. And I think they just made all of his stuff private and the job said he was reassigned or some shit. But then they were like coming for his kid at school. And it's like, come on, that's not. Yeah. Like, is this a parent that you want on the board of your school? That back He's not like, on the board. He's at Chipotle. Like, like but if he's some fucking do good ass parent in the fucking school board system, shouldn't that count against the sentencing? Like, yeah. it's like that's not even taken. Okay, so right. I got arrested when I was nineteen, right? Mm-hmm. So I stole some credit cards, and we got we got popped for credit card fraud. And before sentencing. You literally get an opportunity to call people who will write letters on your behalf of what a decent motherfucker you are. You also get to present all of these different things about yourself that you in the hopes that that changes some of your sentencing. The Internet doesn't have that. Right. That's interesting because what you're bringing about is that when whenever there's a. Let's say a crime occurs like in that case or something um you know negative like somebody tweets something or says something awful we always just go this this one thing is what defines this person you know like it Mm -hmm. and it's not just you're not just defined like we've all had said terrible things things we regret done terrible things but hopefully you're made up by more than just hey the you know the bad thing you know what i mean like your 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 life is more than just your worst moments the difference though is that at least with crime somehow like there's people who like I've said this on stage. I say you can't support cancel culture and prison reform. Right. And there's people that do and prison reform in and of itself is built around making sure that there's more fair sentencing put in place so people can get on with their life. Yeah. And so that part of the internet swarm has not been installed yet. The internet justice, the criminal justice system versus the internet justice system. You mm-hmm. see, my brother, we got to yeah. break this down. Break this shit down, man. Just the system. <laughs> like, there's no sentencing guidelines in the internet justice system. So, in spite of what you do, you can still try to come back out into the world and someone new discovers it yeah. and it comes back up to the top. Like, no one can ever bring up. Oh, you stole credit cards when you were not. Absolutely. I checked all the boxes. I did my probation. I paid my fine. I did all everything I was supposed to do. I'm back. And people yeah. go, cool. Welcome yeah. back. Now, now, I probably shouldn't be working at a post office for the rest of my life because that's where <laughs> I stole the credit card from. But okay. yeah, that's understandable. But right, no one's right. going to try to bring that back up ever again this episode of two bears one cave is also brought to you by blenders eyewear uh fresh from san diego california comes an amazing sunglass company i'm talking about blenders eyewear you're going to be hooked i got the black tundra i got the alpine moon uh super cool designs these these are like some of the best designs i've seen and of course they're not going to break the bank chase fisher started blenders by selling his beachy shades out of a backpack while doubling as a surf instructor on Pacific Beach. Man, surfers have, they know how to get out of work, you know? Um, Unlike expensive big brand shades that you've probably lost or smashed in the past, blenders are actually affordable, so you're not going to cry as much when, you know, you smash them. Blender's team of in-house designers are constantly coming up with new styles from orange polarized wraparounds, tortoise shell frames with purple lenses to classic gold arms and black lenses. To score 15% off your Blenders purchase, visit blenderseyewear.com. Enter the promo code BEARSVIP. That's blenderseyewear.com. The code is BEARSVIP for 15% off. Blenders rocked with pride worldwide.
This episode of Two Bears, One Cave is brought to you by Bud Light Seltzer. Bud Light Seltzer launches the limited edition retro summer tie-dye variety pack after a summer of being distant, apart, and feeling gray. Summer of 2021 is a chance to make up for lost time. It has been. This has been an awesome summer, bringing good vibes. Wherever you go, the Bud Light Seltzer new tie-dye variety pack is slamming. This variety pack features three iconic summer flavors. Cherry Limeade, Blue Raspberry, and Summer Ice. These flavors take inspiration from nostalgic summer favorites. And surprise, these three delicious flavors will also come in frozen form as an ice pop. Why didn't they send those? I want to hang out in the backyard. I want to hang out on the lake. I want to barbecue. I want to drink Bud Light Seltzer. And I want to have a Bud Light Seltzer ice pop. And I want to get about 100 of them. This is exactly what I'm talking about. That's what spending summer is about. Outdoors with friends with a refreshing alcoholic beverage. Both are available for a limited time this summer. So hurry, you can get them delivered right to your door by going to BudLight.com slash delivery or pick it up at your local neighborhood grocery, convenience, or liquor store. Well, let me ask you a relevant question. You sold credit cards. You were 19. You went to FAMU. Did you provide Peter Warwick? With the credit cards that he used. We did that shit before Peter Warwick and Lavernius Coles, and that's part of the reason why they Damn. got caught, because Dillitz was hip to the shit. I was the okay. fucking originator. <laughs> Respectfully to Peter Warwick and Lavernius Coles. I know you don't know. Oh but man. We did that shit. We went in Dillard's in fucking Tallahassee Mall with mm-hmm. a credit card that wasn't ours and got jeans. And then the motherfucker at the register charged us for like a belt or something. Oh, something right, right. That right. cost four dollars. Yeah. And yeah. then they got they got Hip to it, put it together, security footage yeah, or whatever. Man. All right. There was, but th- there was, there's, I don't know. It, it's just, it's a, it's a touchy subject for me just because I've been on the edge of being thrown away by society because of that. Mm-hmm. And it took a lot of people taking chances on me in spite of me having a felony Yeah, for me to keep progressing. Yeah, you know, and this was something that happened when I was nineteen, and bro, I was dealing with ripple effects of that. I had three years of probation. I was dealing with ripple effects of that shit till I was damn near thirty. Did it like, affect show business at all too? Like, does no, that ever? No, no, never. That's the crazy part. Like, I yo, radio does not give a fuck about your sins, and neither does comedy. Yeah. Which I guess is part of the problem that a lot of people have with what's <laughs> happening with standups. Yeah. <laughs> but yeah. the like, flaws yeah, no that problem. you have make yeah. you more. You know, I don't know. Like I remember when I had. Um, so you get arrested and you're awaiting sentencing or whatever. Mm-hmm. And during that time, I started working at Golden Corral, and so. When I got sentenced, I got probation instead of prison. That's part, that's how I got into stand up. I thought I was uh-huh. going to prison, so I started doing comedy to deal with depression because I was like, I've thrown my life away. I know I'm a die in prison, so fuck it, let's try stand up. Mm-hmm. But then I got probation. First thing my probation officer says to me is, "Yeah, you're gonna have to. I have to verify your employment, which means I have to show up where you work and see you in uniform and see you actively conducting your job." Yeah. And then I have to talk to your supervisor. And I thought for sure I was going to get fucking fired, bro. Like I was like, fuck, man. And so probation officer comes in, talks with the supervisor. Supervisor calls me in the office and I'm like doing the whole. It was a long time ago. And yeah. It had only been like four months. But yeah, that yeah, was yeah. a long time ago. I'm a different person. And. You know, I'm not on register. I ain't touching no credit cards. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and he said, Roy, half this fucking restaurant is on probation. <laughs> and he fucking walked me around the back of the house. And Golden Corral, the owner, this is one of those places where if you hire felons, you get the tax break on whatever employment uh-huh. tax credit gibber shit. And so it was a place full of people all getting second chances. So... I spent my early 20s surrounded by people who made mistakes far legally worse than me. Yeah. And I saw the good in them. So it just it just changed how, you know, what people can be on the other side of a fuck up and still holding out hope that people can be that. Whereas now 
we're very much wanting to throw people away yeah immediately without giving them a chance let's be real a lot of motherfuckers ain't remorseful and they're not sorry but for the ones that are you know what's the what's the arrangement you know we live in a world where there's no set standard on even like we don't even know what an apology is supposed to look like you could apologize and somebody could tell you keep that apology motherfucker A lot of apologies are broken down. People go, that's not, that wasn't a good apology. Like, all right. Yeah. First they'll go, well, you didn't apologize. Then you go, I'm sorry. And then they'll go, well, keep that apology. And then you'll do a professional apology. Well, you didn't write that apology. Right. Well, you have to live. I think it was Marin years ago. Like, I don't know, first 20 episodes of this podcast. He talked about the inconvenience of living an apology. Mm Mm-hmm. And so, you know, at some point you have to get past, you have to forgive yourself. And I think that's the thing that a lot of us have trouble with is this idea with forgive with apology and forgiveness, this idea that I need permission from strangers to be a better person. You know, like I don't yeah. need your permission to turn over a new leaf. Right. You know, there's certain people that'll that'll never fuck with me again because of certain things that I've done. And I understand that, but I still have to move forward. You have and to not behave that way. I just think, though, you know, you have to have some sort of system. At some point of. You know, a sentencing guideline, for lack of a better phrase, but, you know, we're not going to get to that anytime soon because it's more fun to just tell people, fuck you. Yeah, that's a big it's a big part of the uh you know the internet fun for people today and social media is just it's all about dropping as hard a fucking bomb as you can on people whenever a mistake is made. Okay, but then what happens on the other side of that? What's the corrective thing on the other side? Like cuz to some degree if you offended by some shit a motherfucker said, you got a right to speak on that shit. Sure. Speak on it. Say what you got to say. Come for my job. If my job doesn't fire me, do whatever you got to do. But at yeah. some point, when when do I get to just continue? Like, it's tough, bro, because there are certain people out there that are never going to be satisfied with anything that you do as retribution. Right. As restitution. Excuse me. And so what do you do with those people? And that's the hard thing because corporations are still going to listen to those people because corporations don't care about nuance. I'm going to fucking fire you. Hey, they care Chuck, about numbers. Yeah. You were in Chipotle cussing out a Latina woman. I got to fire you because you're fucking with profits. Yeah. Phil, you know me. Our kids are, I'm on the fucking school board at this. Yeah. Phil, why would you do that? Yeah. yeah. Don't Sorry, matter. Chuck. You got to fucking go. So this expectation that we want, I think that's unrealistic though, from our side as comedians and shit. I think it's very unrealistic of us to expect conglomerates that only care about money to add nuance to a conversation. They're not gonna fucking do, like SNL is a great, oh oh, fuck, that's a great example with uh, Shane Gillis. Mm Mm-hmm. There was never going to be a nuanced conversation around that. No. This is bad for business. And that's bigger than Lauren Michaels. Yeah. People act like that's just SN. Motherfucker, this is NBC Universal. You don't know how far up the totem pole the protest may go for this guy. Yeah. Like, it could just be boycott SNL, boycott NBC, boycott Peacock. Fuck the whole. NBC Universal, fuck Universal Studio. Is that really worth keeping Shane Gillis over? Yeah. To prove that was a, it's not. Yeah, I mean, go, but bro. also, don't you feel like when when people do do those like kind of masks, like this guy works here, we got to, I, I remember that story coming out and being like, oh, they're, you know, they're coming after him. But sometimes you, you hear that mob thing happen and it just passes. You know, like it, it misses its target. And with that one, I didn't know. I didn't know what was going to happen with that. And then they were like, no, we're not. We're going to let him go now. So it I felt would, like for a minute it could go either way because yeah. SNL, you know, but most people that have said or done something in the public sphere where SNL is concerned, they were already hired. 
Yeah, yeah. So you're kind of already a little Teflon in a way. Yeah, I, I and you're you know you're right that no one's going to pay attention to the nuance. I thought that you it can't was have so... that and have Bo and Yang on the show. You can't, dog. That shit yeah. is funky. It's yeah. a bad clubhouse. Like it's sports. It's a bad clubhouse. Right. So I guess th- when you saw the clip though, on the side of when you saw the clip, didn't you think it was like playing like faux, um, reckless and like you know what I mean? Like like if you go as a comic as a comedian, yes, yeah, yes, okay, yeah, that's what I as thought. As a comedian, too. yes, but yeah. what we also have to respect is that everybody doesn't see podcasting as a stage. Like right. when you're like, we get upset. That, would you you couldn't tell that I was yeah. fucking joking? Yeah. No motherfucker, I couldn't because right. I've seen forty million other podcasts where they fucking don't do shit like that. Right, right. If it yeah. had been on stage, it's more defensible. That's why I try to tell stand ups, man, the yeah. crazier shit you want to say, you need to be protected by the microphone and that ten foot moat between you and the audience. It's something yeah. about that moat where a lot of per- perception of intention you're given more of a benefit of the doubt if you mm-hmm. perform it versus when you're just chit-chatting. Because when you're just chit-chatting, now you're leaving it up. And see, now we're going to get into the radio shit, bitch, because I got suspended three times doing <laughs> terrestrial radio. <laughs> Decency. I'm going to yeah. fucking find it, and I'm going to fucking read it to you. Okay. Because after the Janet Jackson titty yeah. in 03, you're we on the air somewhere? Huge, yeah, I was on air. I did mornings in Birmingham for like almost a decade or so, give or take. Mm-hmm. Can With I ask you one question real quick file. before that? Yeah. Do you feel like, you know, like Alabama has such a, like a need, like the the word, the, the, the name, there's such a knee jerk reaction from people. Do you find it like any desire or or anything in you that goes, you know, I I like to change people's perception of Alabama. Like when, you know what I mean? Like you hear Alabama, most people not from there or from the South just go like, geez, you're from Alabama. You know, it's always like this. They have like a an immediate reaction. And do you, does that affect you in any way? No, but that's why I always talk and represent Alabama. Anytime I'm on TV or anything, anytime I can just sneak in the word Alabama, it at least makes you double clutch and go, oh, wow, this is, Maybe some decent motherfuckers from Alabama. Yeah. He's from yeah, Alabama. Yeah. He's not yeah. like all the others. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Uh, yeah. All right. Well, maybe there's some good motherfuckers. Yeah. So you do have so, pride, though. You do have Alabama pride. Absolutely. But yeah. I mean, I'm not going to turn the whole tide of public perception. I mean, yeah. as we speak right now, we're dead last in COVID vaccinations at 36% statewide. Mm-hmm. So, yeah, there's going to be some some weird racism. This is um, where I'm sitting right now is the county where a month ago, a white dude called a black woman at a school board meeting the N word to her face in front of other parents. Like, like really? that type of shit. Yeah. He called her a house nigga. Like just, they were arguing about something and just in the middle of it, he just fucking, do we have a house nigga in here? And you almost have to listen to it twice. Cause I feel like he did nigga with an A. Which mm-hmm. I kind of respect. I was like, you know, <laughs> looking well played. <laughs> You're like, what? I didn't say it right? How do y'all say it? Jesus. Yeah, Christ. it's 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 a place that is definitely behind on a lot of things, but there are a lot better people here than what makes the headlines. Right. I shot my Comedy Central, I shot my pilot here for my sitcom two years ago. In Birmingham. In fucking Birmingham, full crew, locals, and they loved it. Like, as far as Comedy Central, like, they were, so, like, telling people you want to shoot something in Birmingham, I may as well have said, hey, man, wouldn't yeah. it be cool if we shot this in Mississippi in the forest with two cameras? Like, the same yeah. level of nervousness and trepidation. Sure. And they were all shocked, which I have to try not to be fucking insulted by. You know, like, that that part of it is is difficult but Mm. yeah i I, I feel that need man so yeah i did mornings for and that's the other thing you see the people you're out in the community we did local morning show you know so we we got to have fun and push the envelope but you know if a tornado hit we were fucking out there bro yeah we were out there before anybody else 
um, you know, talking to people and helping people and all of that shit. Um, yeah. Sorry, but it, you were talking it, about radio. You said you, you had three violations or whatever, like, um, or uh, you got written up. I got, I got suspended. I used to do prank phone calls, so I got suspended on a regular basis for those. Like, like, th- like that was just. Wait, who would suspend you? The station? My program director. Yeah, the station. Like, dude, this is still Jesus territory. And some of the stuff but, I was saying to people for the sake of a laugh. <laughs> like, it, it would immediately. Yeah, Roy, we're going to have to fucking. We're going to have to sit you down. So so to, here's here's what I'm talking about. So. O three Janet Jackson, the titty falls out. Right, the titty falls out. Yeah, Super Bowl halftime show, and that changed the face of radio. That changed the face of what was considered decent and indecent in radio. And in the legal language, and this is from the FCC, and I think this is where it kind of falls into what we're talking about now with Twitter and outrage and all of that shit. And this is this is quote. Um, this is about the FCC's indecency standard. A broadcast will not be found to meet the definition of indecency where the material does not refer to sexual or excretory organs. So you can't talk about like you could talk about ass, but you can't stick something in an ass. Okay. You could say throw up, but you can't say I vomited like it's little nuanced shit like this. Right. And so here's the other thing for indecency. The FCC uses a national standard for judging whether questionable material is consistent with the contemporary community standards. Contemporary community standards has been branded into my fucking brain for my entire life. And that just means whatever the mob thinks is indecent is indecent. I got you. So it's really up to your own interpretation. Like the program director can just say it. Well, but the program director justifies my suspension because they call or called. And if they call or called, that means there were 10 other people who were going to call. Mm -hmm. For example, although Janet Jackson revealed her breast for only a split second, the FCC concluded that it was indecent material because everybody in America was outraged by it. Right. Right. It wasn't indecent in terms of the literal. There was no nipple. It was pasty, like whatever, like. Oh, was there? Was there full nipple? I think there was. I don't think there was full nipple. Was there full nipple? Then I will look it up while we're talking. And so when I look at anything that someone says online that they say was just a joke, whether it's podcast or a tweet or something like that, if the streets say you wrong, the jury has spoken, my dude. Yeah. So you can sit here and defend it and go that y'all fucking soft and y'all need to fucking change, but that's not going to change any of what the contemporary community standards are. Wow. And those things change. That's why people were able to get away with jokes in 02 that you're not able to get away with now. Yeah. And by the way, as it should be like that, right? I always felt like if, um, you know, the comedy and society changes every few years, as it should. So sometimes people have brought up like old jokes. I'm like, yeah, it's not that I go, oh man, I. I deeply regret that joke when they go like, why wouldn't you do it now? I'm like, well, it's just fucking dated and there's a different set of standards and everything's changed. Like, why would I do the same fucking joke now? It doesn't, it's not the same see, culture we're in. But see, and that, but that's the problem with jokes, man. And that's the problem with the killer bees with the, with the, with the swarm on the internet is that. All right. If I used to be overweight, right. Mm-hmm. And then you see me now, you can see progress. Yeah. You can see I'm a different person. Yeah. There's no metric by which to measure morals. So if you saw the shitty joke that I made in 02, you could just assume that I'm still that shitty of a person. Right. The only thing I'm armed with now is no, I'm not. And some degree of look at all these nice things I've done in between yeah. that joke. And if you've done things that are to the counter. Right. Of that. Right, right. Right. But if they catch you before you've done those things, then you're fucked. Oh, then you're toast. Yeah. yeah. Because they don't give you that space for discovery to present. They don't get, you don't get to get people to speak on your behalf before they decide whether or not you have morally evolved. Yeah. Since 2002. 
By the way, there was a pasty, but you could still see some nipple. That's the update. Areola or nipple? Areola's for the streets. Everybody <laughs> should do. Areola. You've seen a little bit of both. Oh. Come on now. Oh, okay. So yeah. By the but, way, I mean, uh, who wasn't thrilled to see Janet Jackson's nipple? What's wrong with you? We're not happy. Yeah, but to compare see that to J Lo's Grammy dress when she was wearing the green, oh, whatever my God, the fuck on the red carpet or whatever it was. Yeah, yeah, but somehow the contemporary community standards, nobody was pissed. She was so just standing flies. there naked. Let's be honest. She was just standing there naked. Jail. And I wasn't I mad at that either. I was not upset. <laughs> this episode of Two Bears, One Cave is also brought to you by ShipStation. We all have things we want to do in life. We're busy. And you know what helps? When something like ShipStation comes along, the number one choice of online sellers, you can import orders from any sales channel, ship with any carrier, use ShipStation's deeply discounted rates, automate just about any shipping task. No matter what you sell, Shopify, Etsy, it's on your own website. ShipStation funnels all your orders into one simple interface you can manage from anywhere, even your cell phone. You get access to amazing discounts, whether it be with UPS, FedEx, USPS. So much time, so much money is saved. I wish I'd had ShipStation 10 years ago when I started shipping things. Ship more in less time and for a lot less money. Just use my offer code CAVE to get a 60-day free trial. That's two months free of no hassle, stress-free shipping. Just go to ShipStation.com, click on the microphone at the top of the homepage and type in CAVE. That's ShipStation.com. Enter the offer code CAVE. Make ship happen. This episode of Two Bears, One Cave is also brought to you by Fiverr. We've all got that kind of odd thing we're, we're good at, but no one's great at everything. And Fiverr connects you to the best-in-class freelancers with experience in hundreds of digital specialties and every imaginable skill to help you with any project from data wizards that can turn spreadsheets into insights to voice actors that can bring scripts to life and everything in between. I know the guys in the office have used Fiverr for things here and there, whether it's marketing things, uh, data, tech. It's really easy to just go and use the global network of on-demand freelance talent that is there to help, whether you're launching your first business, scaling your current business, or just in need of extra support from graphic design, copywriting, marketing, web programming, film editing, scoring music, and more, you will find talent there that you are looking for. Find a freelancer with the specific skills you need for your next project. Check out fiverr.com and receive 10% off your first order by using my code CAVE. Find all the digital services you need in one place at F-I-V-E-R-R.com, code CAVE. Again, that's fiverr.com. The code word is CAVE. The like only that. time I've really had a concern with like any type of internet mob activity yeah. as it relates to me is when I took over for Ari for this is not happening. For real? Like, that's the only time. I, like Because I didn't... Well, let's just, let me just stop stuttering. Yeah. Ari's fans are unpredictable. Mm -hmm. They are loyal. Mm -hmm. And they are dedicated yeah. <laughs> and they yeah. fucking love Ari. Yeah. And he spoke. And the only reason I can speak about this now is because Ari spoke about this shit song on Rogan earlier this year. And when he got fired from This Is Not Happening, because he got into it with Comedy Central, mm -hmm. and, and, you know, they went back and forth with a bunch of hosts and all of that. You know, the Ari was suggesting people, and, and the network decided they wanted me to host that bitch. And it's two weeks before taping. And if I don't host it, it's looking like they're going to cancel the taping. Mm -hmm. they're, and it's like 60 fucking comics booked to do the show. And so I call Ari. They call me and ask me. And I go, oh, I got to think about it. So then I call Ari and I go, look, man. Should I do this? And he goes, yes, you should. Because it's going to help the comedians and you know this is not happening man the show is special because it was Ari's Ari created that he curated that over years yeah. you know locally but the thing that made that show so special is that he was giving opportunities to comedians with a style that did not fit the traditional late night construct yep so it was a lot of niggas on that show that didn't that wasn't eaten otherwise not on a regular basis like the way the way Ali Sadiq works you can't you can't put that on 
Seth Meyers a Conan in a five minute. It just doesn't. It's not going to be the same. No. It's a very special show. And so, you know, Ari and I went back and forth about it. And I go, all right, dude, I'm going to do it. I'll host the fucking show. And I had been, and I'll be the first to say that there were better people that should have been picked that were more of the show in terms of being a fabric of that culture and having Mm -hmm. been on a couple times. I'd come close once or twice, so they knew I had stories. It was just a matter of me not, you know, not booking it in those particular years. And then I go to R and I go, bro, now you know when your fucking fans find out that you're not hosting this show, it is going to be fucking mayhem on the internet. And Ari's like, well, yeah, I mean, you know, it's not going to be that bad, bro. You'll, 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 you'll soldier through. It's not as bad as Daily It'll Show shit, right? It'll be fine. It'll be fine. It'll be fine. <laughs> Ari is trying to get me to justify taking it on the chin because clearly with the Daily Show, I get some level of hate mail. And I go, right. yeah, I do. But, yeah. but it's not I don't. So pointed it, <laughs> and uh, vicious as it is with Ari's your Ari's fans, fans right? will show up. Right. I believe these strike me as the type of motherfuckers who'll pull up if you want some fuck shit. So I go, all right, fine. He's, you, you'll be fine, man. I mean, I, I I wish I could help you, but if I help you, it's essentially me endorsing Comedy Central, and I can't endorse, I can't endorse it. But you know, but you just thanks, man. Thank you, bro. Thank you for saving. Appreciate me. your help, bro. Thanks. All right. This, he left me to the fucking wolves. <laughs> so. Oh, shit. So the announcement comes out, right? Uh-huh. The announcement comes. We get off the phone. The announcement comes out two days later. Fuck that show. I'm not going to fucking watch it. And yeah. fuck it. It was more fuck Comedy Central than fuck Roy, yeah. which yeah, I was yeah. thankful for. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I was like, yeah, 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 yeah. Fuck them. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, but I'm getting like sniper DMs from motherfuckers. And like, motherfuckers are like finding like my. I have a private, I had a private Facebook page at the time that was separate and apart from like my public place. This is my Facebook page for just me and my friends from Birmingham. Fuck you, you motherfucker. It's Ari's show. You stole it. You stole it. Lighting it it up. But I can't say that I can, I can't tell the truth because that's just going to, the truth is worse. You Mm. know what I'm saying? Like I stole Ari's show is worse than Ari was fired from his own show because he wanted to take his hour special somewhere else. This is per Ari. This is what Ari said. Yeah, yeah. Well, I mean, it, they did him dirty, though. Okay, I get, I get but, it. Like, I get the business of it, but it was, it was not. Yeah, it, it was not. It was, it was, it was definitely two people seeing Netflix as two different things at the time. Mm-hmm. You're taking your popularity to Netflix, and Ari's going, "No, I'm using Netflix popularity to bring more people back over here to Comedy yeah. Central." And Comedy yeah. Central didn't see it that way, but that truth is worse than I stole the show. And my job as a host at that point, bro, my only objective is to get people to watch the show so that the comedians could get the shine, because that's the yeah. promise I made Ari. Yeah. So I got to take that shit, and I fucking took that shit, bro. I took that shit f- from the fucking taping. So a fucking year later, God. and that's when it got hot again, when motherfuckers were like coming out of the fucking woodwork when it premiered. Because now you've got images and video and, hey, I'm Roy. I'm the new yeah. host of This Is Not Happening. Yeah. <laughs> Fuck you. you yeah. not fu- they never got racist, though. I'm going to give Ari's fans a lot of credit here. That's cool. Hey, guys. Never got, never, yeah. never got racial. It was just, we. it all came from a place of we love Ari, that's our guy. And if yeah. it's not our guy, fuck it. Which I understand, and I wasn't yeah. even mad at it. I, I almost, in a way, like, it didn't affect me, but I'm just saying that's the one time where, like, every day, like, even if I was at a show, and mind you, this whole time, Ari and I are fucking doing shows together. Yeah. We're still on the same bill right, doing in New York. Yeah. I'm like, we're friends. Why the fuck are you? I <laughs> guarantee it. Ari hearing this right now is like, I really can't believe nobody was racist. That's amazing. I can't believe it. <laughs> <laughs> My friends weren't racist here. <laughs> so, so fucking, so like, what part, you know what part of it is though? Is that, it, like when I did Last Comic Standing in 2010, that was like the first real year of live tweeting maybe the year before, like the concept of an actor being on a show while talking on the internet while the show was on. 
Mm-hmm. NBC contractually made us live tweet Last Comic Standing every week. And so you'd follow the hashtag and your job was to interact with positive messages within the hashtag. Mm-hmm. But also within the hashtag is all of the negative shit yeah. that's being said about you. So you've just performed your heart out on TV and then you have to sit down on a couch and enter and just read the every week, bro. And I made it all the way to the finale. So it's two months every Monday night for two hours. I'm just reading all of the worst shit that could ever be said about me. And somewhere around week three or four, I was like, Oh, these people just, this is their outlet. Yeah. It's you figured it personal. Out. Yeah. It literally, it changed every, like I, I read Like I know comics who don't read their comments and I mute the YouTube. I, I can read it or not, but it doesn't bother me. Like, and that probably prepared me the most for, you know, when daily show gets out of pocket, you know, once or twice a year mm-hmm. and for that shit with Ari, but let me show you how karma works. So Ari does the, the, the fucked up tweet, the, the fuck, what was it? The, the, the fuck, the, the Kobe the, tweet, right? Yeah. Yeah. Kobe tweet. Yeah. The, the tw- we'll just say the, well, tweet the video too, anything. right? The video. Yeah. Yeah. So uh, Ari, Ari, I won't say what Ari did, but Ari did something that pissed off the black community very, very bad. I'm not going to yeah. say what he did because there's going to be new people who find out about it for the first time. And then they're going to, what? I just now found out. Yeah. You need to apologize to me. Right. So that was that was either the week leading up to the Super Bowl or the week before. Was, and I, it, when was, I say, it was before. Okay. And Ari's getting death threats from black people. And if a black person is given a death, like white death threats are 50 50. <laughs> but a, a black death threat, mm-hmm. yeah. 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 You got you to gotta consider that yeah. shit. Yeah. That's f- for real. Because that's already, <laughs> you're committing a crime. And yeah. this black person is already, I'm already one felony in just. <laughs> Just to get the conversation started, spot me a felony so you know I'm good for the next three or four felonies that are coming. Right. I saw Ari at a Super Bowl party. We have a mutual friend, and I just happened to see him at a Super Bowl party. And I'm I'm pretty sure I was the first black person he made eye contact with since pissing off all of black America. Because mm-hmm. he, like, looked away at me and kind of looked down and shit, like, oh, no, is yeah. Roy mad? And Yeah, yeah. I walk over to him and I go, so have you been on the internet lately? And he goes, no. How bad is it? I go, it's fucking bad, Ari. It's fucking bad, bro. Like most of black America wants to beat the shit out of you. Mm -hmm. And the rest are looking at your road dates and deciding which city to come kick your ass in. God damn. And I wish I could say something to defend you. But if I defend you, I'm only <laughs> condoning what you yeah. did. Yeah. Yeah. But you're a strong dude. <laughs> and I think you'll weather it just uh, fine. Uh, you'll be all right. <laughs> it fucking walked off. That's for not covering for me, bitch. <laughs> <laughs> oh, shit. Did you, did you in any of that, um, this is not happening hate that you got, did you ever engage? Did you ever respond, reply, anything? No, no never. Cause it didn't, it didn't. The only one that I almost said something to was someone who's related to a comic in LA was talking shit to me. And oh. that part of it was a little weird, but he was young. Like he was under 25. Like I didn't. Yeah. You know, some kid under 25 DMing you and talking shit. He, it's fine. And it wasn't anything. It was just fuck you. And not no. Okay. Engage why? If anything, I'm better. I have an opportunity to bring new people to the show. No, I think you're so, smart, man. I mean, like, the, I think one of the hardest things that people struggle with during those things is is being able to not engage. It's harder to not engage for most people. They read it and they're like, "I want to respond to all these things," you know. Well, go to the NBC live tweeting school of internet hate tolerance. And yeah, YouTube can be zen like. Yeah. <laughs> like me. <laughs> yeah. That shit was fucking wild, bro. Everything yeah, you saw vicious funny. things. And then the West Coast, then the West Coast feed would come. Oh, and you'd my have to God. read the West Coast hate. 
You'd get your East Coast hate, and then you'd have the, you know, you get an hour breather. Like, <laughs> then you have to come back to your laptop. And you're like, oh, there's West Coast hate now? <laughs> <laughs> who no, who, man, had, that who was more hateful, bothered, the East Coast man. or the West Coast? East Coast. East Coast is all the asshole cities. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Phillies and New York's and oh, your yeah. fucking. Yeah. Jersey, you know. Baltimore, fucking. Yeah. Ohio's pretty surprisingly. A lot of haters in Ohio. A lot of haters in Ohio? Yeah, a lot of angry people in Ohio, at least back then. Maybe because Ohio State was eating shit against Alabama a lot. I don't know. Uh oh. We're going to be taking all the way back to Bama and college football. Suck yeah, on those I'm, nuts. I'm not even caught up in that shit, bro. I You're not? Sell soda. I used to sell sodas at Bama games. They're all drunks. <laughs> I. I respectfully and i know you love your shit but at the game they're drunk those people yeah. are drunk yeah we used to we used to sell sodas and then we would wait till after the game to walk this to walk the bleachers and just mm-hmm. pick up wallets and fucking little fucking mini bottles and shit oh yeah you ever yeah. find a good score you ever have a good find you know what i mean like after a game where you're like oh man this is actually this is not bad right because, you gotta remember though this is mid 90s this is like 93 94 alabama so like, yeah the, it's not a lot of cell phones but oh, like right, I think right. we're still car phone era yeah, yeah at this point and i mean you didn't really know what to do with the credit card other than take it to somewhere formal like sure pay at the pump wasn't even a thing yet so you couldn't even get free gas like yeah it just wasn't there was no mail ordering you were just literally looking for cash and for alcohol yeah Back in those days, I thought alcohol would make me better at baseball. <laughs> and, you could play and, better if you were drinking. Yeah, yeah. I had teammates. At te- we well, we used to play other teams in the city who would be drunk. We would get high and play basketball in like in college. You know, organized like <laughs> no, like, like intramural, like, like inter- go to the gym and like, but like run games, but smoke a little weed before. And um, I don't know, sometimes, here's the thing. It, you're either in the zone and you're hitting everything, and you're like, it's the weed. Or you smoke some and you're just a fucking disaster. And everyone's like, man, you cannot get high and play ball. Bro, we went we went and played some, we played inner city schools. We were, I went to a city school and we just didn't, the, Birmingham City didn't take baseball seriously. So you're playing motherfuckers wearing jeans and shit. Like, <laughs> like yeah. Like we were the serious school and every other school, baseball is what basketball and football guys play just to keep in shape. Right. So it didn't really, it was intramural for them, essentially. Mm-hmm. For us, it was dead ass serious, but they would show up to practice, bro. They would show up to games and they would be drunk. We would see them drinking like Old English and Mad Dog in the parking lot and they would walk on that field shit face drunk and motherfucker would go three for four with two homers. What? And, like, drunk and well, yeah you hear about those the, those pros that get fucked up too a lot of those guys would drink some of them would do coke and everything but the drinking was pervasive especially like 20 30 years ago you, oh you're talking like 70s i thought you was talking like babe you're talking like doc ellis throwing yeah hitter on acid on acid but like <laughs> that era of 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 pro baseball player was drinking like they were all you know on a bus in a hotel and and it was kind of more I mean, drinking in clubhouses was more accepted back then. Some of those guys yeah. fucking smoking cigarettes in the fucking. You see that Joe Namath? You see that oh, yeah. Joe Namath picture of him in the locker room yeah. in the halftime? Just halftime, <laughs> having a cigarette and a beer. <laughs> fucking crazy. Yeah. There's, there's that, that probably started my alcohol. Like, I wasn't curious about alcohol till I saw people be good at it, be good at baseball on it. Really? Before that, I didn't give a fuck about alcohol. I, mm-hmm. yeah, whatever. But then, my, so when we would steal fucking minis at fucking Bama games, yeah, I'm taking this home and I'm gonna drink this before fucking. You know, in the fall we were playing like little pickup games or whatever. I was like, let me just see if I. Play. And I was terrible. You were terrible. I was terrible. I was terrible sober. Like, <laughs> like they say, alcohol just makes you more of what you already were, and mm-hmm. I was just more terrible. Did <laughs> like, you? <laughs> Did you, uh, you, that's your game though? Baseball is your shit? Yeah. Um, like to the point where I played softball for the comedy store. Wow. Like, loved like any form of it. Like to this day, I'll fucking play it in a heartbeat. But it wow. sucks because you can't really do pickup softball. Yeah. You got to have, yeah, you got to have 
all the uh, well, you got people involved, and I guess it's it's just been on a decline, right? Like it had been for the like COVID when we were kids it in New York, bro. Oh yeah. Did you think about leaving New York? Like if it wasn't for the Daily Show, would you? It wasn't for would the you Daily be, Show. You would leave in, New York. In hindsight, I still should have left. I should have really? left for a year. In yeah. hindsight, but it, you just didn't know. Is it going to get a little better? Yeah, is yeah. it going to get a little better? Yeah. The problem was the only other places I had to go were worse than New York, and that was Atlanta and Birmingham. Yeah. You know, go where and do what? I, we came to Birmingham for two months and stayed with my mom and did lockdown in Birmingham. But I'll be honest, by the end of it, I was fucking itching to get back to New York. There's a certain a certain feel of a big city that spoils you. Yeah. And when you go home, there's just certain things you can't even like it's Birmingham. The city closes at nine thirty. Like even when they were still open doing stuff and the numbers were going through the roof. It just just certain access to certain stuff. But it was cool to be around my friends more. Most of my friends, all of my friends are down south for the most part. That they're, they're non comics. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? Sure. That so, like you grew up with and everything, they're all correct. Yeah correct so yeah man it it, i don't even know if i want to stay after this like i'll I'll put it this way so long as i'm on the daily show then i gotta be there but i mean i had a five-year-old he just started kindergarten so Mm -hmm. if we're gonna move the next place is you gotta drop anchor because i'm not gonna i'm not gonna fuck him by come to austin come to austin You know, my issue with Austin, man, is that for if you make a two hour circle around Austin and a two hour circle around New York, it's more stage time in a tri in a tri state. I I definitely give you that. That's my only that's my only gripe in terms of diversity of work close to home. Like by living in New York, there's about a month and a half of proper road work that I can do and still commute home every night if I wanted to. I get that. There's a good, I mean, there's a decent amount and it is growing from here. What's, um, what's really great is like once you're, hey, I'm working, I'm touring, you're doing a bunch of two and three hour flights as opposed to like four, five, and six uh, hour flights. Yeah. And I'm talking about round trips. Yeah, it's kind of nice. How are you all, have you all changed, the, how much has the presence, of, as I call it, the great comic exodus how much of that has changed the culture in Austin? Like, do y'all have your own culture? Did you have to like merge in with all of the music and shit? I mean, it's, That's you know, there. it's emerging. It's like right now there's like, as of this recording, there's a couple places where there's shows pretty regularly. I'm talking about in proper Austin, but there's about to be within the next six weeks, there will be two more like legit stages. and And then it's a matter of like, I'm watching those evolve like as they are. I've met some great local comics here and everyone's been really receptive. The audiences that I've performed in front of have been like really jazzed, excited that all like these comics are here. We'll see. I mean, there's, you know, it's still, it's still like in the midst of, of all the craziness that's going on, but Austin and, and Texas specifically has been, you know, pretty lax on a lot of the, uh, restrictions and stuff so there's still like shows all the time but i don't know how this next month two months is going to go as far as um if things continue to spike are you finally going to see some some things change or is live entertainment like i know this on big picture you can they are not going to cancel big ass shows across the board like they did a year ago because these promotion promoters and these companies cannot afford to they cannot afford to have concerts mm. and and shows just be canceled across they're going to have they're going to say show up with vax cards show up with negative tests show up with masks but they're not going to cancel shows so they're going to there's going to continue to be music here there's going to continue to be comedy um i don't know what's going to what's going to come of it but this city in particular yeah, it, loves live entertainment it's almost like the arts can thrive better in a conservative market yeah. than in a liberal market Oh, which is my yeah. concern right now because I'm shooting my hour special in Denver in October. And like every morning I get up and I watch the local news in Denver mm-hmm. to see what the fuck. Okay. How the numbers. Yeah. Uh, uh, Where'd you pick? Where are you shooting? Um, the fuck you shouldn't have asked me. Sorry. It's at the 
majestic theater. Okay. The fucking Royal Paramount. Uh, no, smaller. I'm not as fucking big as you. Pick a fucking. I'm just smaller. asking, man. Uh, majestic. It, okay. The Gothic. Gothic theater. The Gothic. Okay. There you go. Yeah, okay. Gothic theater. Okay. Intimate, as they say. Intimate. Yeah. But. I also left two weeks. We shoot that in the middle of October, but I left two weeks open at the end of September on some contingency shit. Like, yo, if shit gets wild, this is back in March when we were deciding what city. And I was like, I like Denver, but just in case, let's leave two weeks open at the end of September as some fucking NFL flex scheduling, major league baseball, let's move the game, double header, off night shit. Because I know for sure New York will be the last to close if the shutdowns start happening from a infection rate standpoint, New York has some of the lowest infection rates. So maybe I can shoot a special that still looks and sounds like something. Right. You know, but damn Denver is a good, that is such a great comedy town, man. It is such a great comedy town. Good IQ, good, good diverse blend of people, good different types of ideologies. I think that's, that's where I want to be for this one. Just cause I'm, uh, is a little weird in parts from some yeah. of the subject matter so i just want to make sure that it is interesting how sense. man it makes a difference that that collective average iq of a city really affects comedy shows it really does you can go back and watch Chappelle's stuff and see why he picked particular like killing them softly i completely get why he chose san francisco mm-hmm. i'm like oh that makes yeah perfect fucking sense this shit is fucking smart fucking you know hitting material you know yeah even Cat Williams, you know, when he did um, when he did DC, um, mm-hmm. versus when he did the special um, in Jacksonville, that one too, which is yeah. such a fucking great inside joke just for comedians. Um, the one in Atlanta, Green Jacket, Pimp Chronicles. Mm-hmm. He did that in Atlanta. The style and the feel of those jokes. Mm-hmm. That was the place. That was the right. that was the right place, you know, to do that material. But yeah, I'm I'm. I got my fingers crossed. It just, in the meantime, you got to keep going out and doing shows. So, you know, I'm as careful as I can. I don't yeah. do meet and greets. But, Fuck no. You know, like, other than that, like, I'm, I'm on a plane. I will still go and grab a bite. I try to, I go to Cracker Barrel. I sit in the corner. Yeah. <laughs> like, I always ask for yeah. a corner seat. And they think it's because I'm scared that someone's going to come in and try to murder me. <laughs> and I'm like, no. Nah. No. Nah. I just know that at least in the corner I have two walls, so that's two less directions yeah. for the COVID to attack me from. Man, I know. Football is almost here, and there's no better place to get in on the action than with DraftKings, the official daily fantasy partner of the NFL. As the season is quickly approaching, DraftKings is your one-stop shop to make it rain all season long. To bring you even closer to the action, DraftKings is giving all new players a free shot at a million dollars during week one. You haven't tried DraftKings yet? Preseason is the perfect time to test your strategy. It's simple. Just pick your lineup, stay under the salary cap, and see how your team stack up against the competition. Nothing adds to the excitement of watching a game quite like having a free shot at huge cash prizes. While you're perfecting your daily fantasy skills, don't forget to check out DraftKings free-to-play pools where there is even more cash up for grabs. Head to the app now. Download the DraftKings app now. Use the code BEARS for a limited time. New players get a free shot at a million dollars during week one. Don't miss out on the action. Enter code BEARS to get a free shot at millions of dollars in prizes with your first deposit. That's code BEARS only at DraftKings, the official daily fantasy partner of the NFL. Minimum $5 deposit required. Eligibility restrictions apply. See DraftKings.com for full details. Do you feel like, I mean, this is not going away, you know, in the fucking spring that this is just how we're going to live, you know, like for the foreseeable future. I think this is just how we live until they get into the government mandated aspects of it. You know, you're going to have a bunch of people bitching and moaning about it, but I liken it to bag fees with the airlines. Interesting. You remember how much pushback and outrage there was about bag fees? Absolutely. Yes. The post 9-11 security fees and all of this shit. And they were like, and now we're charging for bags. And people, what the fuck, you motherfucker? Yeah. You can't fucking do And now everybody's cool with it. Everybody's cool with it. What's interesting about bag fees is that 
they came as a result of oil prices, right? So oil prices were spiked through the roof. Was airlines, that 08? Yep, was it 08? before then? 08, no, it was 08. Yeah. You're right. And airlines, of course, pay for a lot of fucking fuel to, to fill those planes, right? So they got huge, huge, huge surge in their prices. So they go, we got to pass these, some of these costs on to our customers. We're doing baggage fees. Start charging 25 and then 50, whatever. So everyone's mm-hmm. everyone's spending an extra, you know, 50 bucks or whatever, create, you know, pulling in all this revenue. Well, then oil prices took a dip and they got to below record lows at one point. And airlines Correct. were like, no, you're already paying this. We're definitely yep. not going to. And it was the first time most of them started seeing profits. Oh, yeah. Yeah. It's because of those extra fees. Those and extra then fees. that's when they started the select seating fuckery and readjusting the seats to change the leg room based on where you sit in the cabin. Unreal. And we're charging bag fees. And now, oh, if you're sitting in front of the wing, it's an extra $40. Exit yeah. row 60 You know, like that type of fuck shit started happening. So yeah, yeah. I just think that all this vaccine card, passport, mandatory, every time when it mutates, you got to go get checked again. Mm-hmm eventually will become the norm or something so fatal happens a mutation that's so fatal happens that will just that it just straightens people the fuck out yeah I and think whoever's left right. standing is who's left standing i think you, you know? might uh, you might be right about that let me ask you a, a a plain question as somebody who also travels a lot what is your feeling i was surprised that there's a there's really like a a spread out a uh, number of opinions on this that i i, I just didn't expect about somebody reclining their seat on a plane like you're on a plane and the person chooses to recline do you feel like that that is allowed it's on the game yeah That's they're made the to recline yeah why do they re- you Dude, do you know how many people go like that's rude you shouldn't recline your seat i'm like what are you, you talking about should work harder in life and sit in a seat where you're not inconvenienced yeah by someone reclining it's that's it's blown my you. mind how many people get upset about it. They get upset. They're like, that's it's considered just, a I'm like, but the seat is designed to recline. Yeah, it's not like I'm using the urinal next to you in an empty bathroom. That's courtesy. Right. That's I'm courtesy. tired. Yeah. Fuck you. Now I will Yours say reclines this, too, motherfucker. You can recline your seat. I don't recline though. I don't recline. Here's here's what I figured out. By reclining your seat as an exhausted comedian, like, for example, back in my radio days or whatever, or even nah, when I was living in L.A., I would do the Sunday night show, which mm-hmm. ends at nine and paperwork and drink until midnight and then be up at four for the 6 a.m. Fl- like, oh, yeah. You get an extra 30 minutes of sleep every flight if you don't recline. If you don't recline, you get extra. If you don't recline, because you can start your sleep journey from the moment the plane boards. Right. Instead of waiting to recline, because now gotcha. you have to wait for the taxi out. That's 15 minutes. And then when it's time to land, she's going to come fucking wake you up and say, hey, unrecline your seat. Right. And now you're stiff because you're Prior not as comfortable it. as you were. Right. Correct. So now you've lost another 20 minutes of sleep on the fucking landing okay. because you're trying to sleep upright. Well, bitch, just learn how to sleep upright. As right. I did, I should do a book on this shit. By the uh, way, I was about to say, you've given me the only reasonable argument for not reclining your seat that I've ever heard in my life. And that is what you just said to me, that you can get more sleep. if you're in a window seat, not yeah. if you're in a middle seat. Now, what I do in the middle seat, I recline a little to create to create that little bit of difference in headroom between uh-huh. the two headrests on right, either right. side of me. And sure. that's where I lay my head. Oh, that right. little nook that little right space. there. That you're that's my little strategy. You're a fucking pro, man. Yeah, that, but I'm not good at sleeping in middle seats. That's not really my thing. I, I, like, I, I might work a little bit on the plane, but mm-hmm. for the most part, I'm a sleeper, bro. Like, yeah. Wake me up when it's time for the fucking Biscoffs, but I got smart enough now. I just ask for them when I board, mm-hmm. you know. And if you're in Comfort Plus on Delta, they'll usually bring them to you, especially if I got the boy with me. Yeah, I want the fucking kid to be happy. Sure. I every now and then I'll edit 
But I've learned that if you're doing any type of real work, motherfuckers can't help but look at your screen. Mm -hmm. They just can't help it. Because I, I, I do it. Like when I see some guy with some spreadsheet and it's just numbers yeah, and you, graphs. Yeah. yeah. You stare at it. Yeah. A little fuck bit. you do. Yeah. Where's that shit? Yeah. Fuck you do. One time on a flight, I accidentally um, had the old porn hub open in the room the night before and just <laughs> and closed the laptop and didn't open it again until I was on the flight and I had my headphones on, but they weren't synced up with the laptop yet. Oh, shit. Yeah. Yeah. What genre were you so watching? I was, uh, 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 come on, it's black, man. In these unprecedented times, you have to support. <laughs> <laughs> uh, support lift up black voices <laughs> Yo, you know what's so fucking racist about porn yeah is whenever it's black women like like whenever it's a black woman in a scene of a porn they're always like in the description of the video it's always why she needs the money oh like, just yeah go on Pornhub and just pull up some iteration the, the shit it's fucked up that the black woman it's need, just, oh, she needs well, it's the money. just it's usually it's just two sluts fucking yeah. one guy yeah, yeah, hot yeah. sluts but if it's a black black woman fucks white man because car broke down and yeah these men ain't shit and she yeah. needs it to support her crack hat i'm like come yeah. on dog i find that you the most racist thing i i learned of in in porn and i really mean this is that if um that there has to make be a distinction made if the woman, let's say the white uh, performer, is having sex with a black guy, and that they also make the distinction behind the scenes, like they go like, "Oh, I don't like I don't work in a racial, like I don't do that, or I haven't been with a black guy yet on camera," and and then like there's fans who are like, "Well, don't or do," you know, they like weighing in on it, and that if she, if a if a porn star is like, "I'm going to do sex with a black guy on camera." That's a thing. Like they have to like make it like, oh wow, this is like, are you are you yeah. you're doing that? Like that to me seems really it's like racist. Changing your gender pronouns. Yeah, and stuff. I spoke with Lisa Ann about that. I did a piece on that for the Daily Show. She started you did? About how like, yeah, I we interviewed Lisa Ann for the Daily Show. This is like four or five years ago, and she was talking about that shit, just about how like literally it it lowers your prices. You lose subscribers because that white Fuck pussy's been tainted by the black yeah. dick and I, it ain't worth five dollars a month on only fans wow. <laughs> i'll give you 150 <laughs> like wow. it's that type of shit like they said um i'm not gonna name names but there's a lot of prominent white women in porn that don't fuck black guys for that reason because they know it'll fuck up their bread yeah and so then the question becomes are you racist or are oh. you just or a are savvy you smart business with your person? money yeah okay yeah and I didn't so think that it was, like was that. kind of what the story, you know, was kind of rooted in. But if everybody fuck, fuck black guys, then that would be the new norm, and you would just have to accept the fact. Well, yeah, it'd just be like another that. another male performer that you're having sex with. But see, but see, I understand. Like porn is different, though, in an equality standpoint, where it's like this is where you're supposed to be. It's supposed to be okay to be weird, right? <laughs> like, this is right. This is the one spot where you're supposed to go. No, I'm only into this thing, and that's what makes me fucking get an erection. So yeah. here's money. Please do that on camera for me. Thank sure. you. Sure. Like, if you're not, I just, I don't know. I, I I know that there's a weird line where, you know, shit is blurry. But, you know, there's people that are just, have you seen this? Um, I forget what it's called, where the women just be butt naked eating and just talking to you while they eat. No. Yeah, it's just it, that's not what it's called, but it, it's <laughs> they just eat like is it? It's not They're usually eating like sandwiches and shit. Mukbang. There we go. I but I thought that mukbang. was have your fact checker. But mukbang isn't that also usually clothed? There's not butt naked mukbang. I've seen oh, some that, butt naked. So, okay. Nadav, I've seen people uh, butt naked eating and just for making the, a mess. For the most part, they're wearing clothes during mukbangs. But can you please look up all nude oh, mukbang? Sure thing. What the fuck was I watching on X Hamster? That was <laughs> <laughs> some creative original shit. That must have been like the fucking <laughs> yeah. 
and one street ball. Yeah. Buck bank. <laughs> yeah. Someone who doesn't follow the rules. Yeah, man. Let's see, let's see if there's, is there a whole category of it? I have naked. found some naked mukbangs, yes. There we go. That's what, yeah. that's what Roy ended up go. on. Yeah. Let me guess. So, They're all black. Uh, <laughs> which one or two? No. I know. Not a lot of black mukbanging going no, on. We don't talk about that at the black barbershop. No. We haven't. <laughs> I saw them, them hoes be eating catfish. <laughs> Motherfucker, shit. She, motherfucker, take a hush puppy, rub it on a pussy. <laughs> she bit that hush puppy. Man, that's somebody's uh, dream is to watch those naked mukbangs. That's wild. I saw a woman smoke a cigarette with her vagina when I was 18, and I was never the same. Yeah. On any of any like wild, weird stuff. Like yeah. at 18, I, I saw too much too soon. Sure. Yeah, and now I'm just like, nah, just give me missionary and just regular porn with a black guy and a black woman, and he's got his sneakers on. Yeah, just <laughs> just give me your original recipe. That's what you. <laughs> 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 just, yeah, you know, as wild as fucking porn stars love comedy, they do. Yeah, I've been hit up by they quite fucking, a few actually. It's I try to explain that to people, and they think I'm being pervy, but like there's yeah. this weird overlap between comedians and sex sex workers and shit where it's just this similar damaged people entertaining strangers absolutely and, thing going on. and it's just manifesting itself differently you know we're, yeah. we're both yeah we're both like trying to get people to validate the, whatever emptiness or what, whatever we need inside of us and you use what you got so you know for comedians we're, we're being funny and for people with beautiful bodies um, they're you know and, and willing to do it they're using sex and it, it always felt it always felt like very comfortable talking to those people and i've also found that everybody in the adult industry that has hit us up and we've done like comedy bits with they've always been the coolest and the nicest to work with coolest always. but yo misty stone mm -hmm. um like like these people were like so fucking kind the thing that was really sad though was we shot we shot the interview with Lisa Ann at this porn house up in the hills, mm -hmm. which from an efficiency standpoint, I've got to really respect porn studios for basically buying a five bedroom house, soundproofing yeah. every room mm -hmm. and every room is just an active porn studio. And there's three, four scenes being shot at any given time concurrently within mm -hmm. the same house and the living room and the kitchen. It's like some sort of weird green room, locker room, yeah. common area <laughs> like that part of it was fucking cool but then the thing that really made me sad there were, we had a lot of we shot a sketch at the end with ron jeremy and there were like all these other porn stars in the room and shit and i guess somebody's car was blocked in or whatever and i end up being the one to move the car and i hadn't been back outside since all of the porn stars had gotten there Every car but one or two was just a fucking beat up fucking duster. Really? And I'm like, like the exploitative part of it, like that's when it was like, damn, the only person making money is a motherfucker that owned this house. Yeah. And like that part of the game. That's why like with all of these folks getting online, doing all this shit and making all this extra bread, fucking good for you, man. Circumvent the fucking porn label record label industry as best you can i wish more comedians had the same fucking absolutely foresight. Dude. and especially of all the things you could do if you're like i'm putting my body out there for you know for public entertainment consumption and people are getting off to it like if you're doing that with your physical body you should reap the benefits you know like what, you should really be the one collecting what is worse what do you think is more painful as a performer? To bomb on stage with some of your most emotionally naked revealing material that you should save only for a therapist. Mm -hmm. Or to do videos of yourself getting choked out while performing oral sex and it only has 80 views. like 
It's your okay. body. You're literally, you're literally sucking a dick on camera. Here's the and thing. Okay, I'll say this. Past it, people looked at the thumbnail. Yeah. of you getting choked down. I'm like, nah. nah. I think if you're like regularly choking, like you, that's like your weekly thing. You're always doing it. Doesn't affect you as much. I think if someone had to talk you into it, and you're like, "All right, all right, I'll, I'll do it," but this is going to get like a million views, then then you would be heartbroken. You're like, "You, I puked on myself for you in this in this video, and it got eighty views. That would be so imagine." Crazy. Here's what I'm getting. At. Imagine if the two girls, one cup chicks, never went viral. How would you feel about yourself? Oh yeah. If you did all of that. And it only had 80 views. You ate shit. You ate shit. It was stuffed up in someone's ass. Into and a you cup. still, and you still couldn't get a thousand subscribers to sustain yourself and pay your bills. Yeah. That, all right. That's more depressing. It is. It's, it's a painful life, man. It's a painful, it's a painful life. life. I, I don't, I don't, I I, you know, I don't know, but then I've also like revealed like. So I opened for Mulaney, mm -hmm. a couple times um, earlier this year. You know, as he's you know he's getting back on the horse and yeah. going out. He's on the road now. This is back when he was in like his New York, Rocky Balboa training montage yeah. days of getting the jokes together, and I was like talking about like deep shit on stage and like. There was punchlines in it, and his audience just had, they were so full of sympathy. Yeah. And so full, they were so full of empathy for the human condition, just people in general, that they wanted, they couldn't even laugh at the stuff. They were like, oh, don't say that about yourself. And I've never felt more embarrassed. I wanted to eat shit. Yeah. That would have gotten more of a reaction. For I know sure exactly. would have gotten more of a reaction. I know exactly what you're talking about, too. And it's hard for um, someone to really appreciate the exact the exact emotion you're talking about is because what happens is when there's certain it's, it's rare usually to find such an empathetic audience but there's times where you you want the silence here but then when you get to this part that's where the laugh should be and when when you are embraced with like more compassion you feel like almost like someone's patting you on the head it's this there's there's almost a level of like humiliation to the feeling yeah. where you're like no no that's a joke. And they're like, it's okay. It's okay. You don't have to make it a joke. You're like, oh my God. No, th this is a joke. <laughs> I was, I'm, I'm working on this. The, I'm not going to do the bit, but the basic premise of it is that I have a friend that's in prison in Alabama mm -hmm. and he got a prison sentence that I felt was unjust. So I spent a couple years trying to figure out ways to level leverage politicians and all this other shit to try and get the law changed and, you know, petition signed and all of that. And it's a deep conversation about criminal justice reform. And then, but it ends with the real, and this is a true realization that I had about myself in this journey. It's like, oh shit, I'm not famous enough to get anybody out of prison. I'm not like, I'm just on cable. Like I'm not, Alabama famous like yeah. they only respect and, and I, you start listening what what yeah. celebrity means and and the fucking like the look on people's faces was like no we like you why would you say that about yeah, yourself you're like no that's not that's not empowering you should be empowered and feel positive with the accomplishment I'm like no that's not what I'm you looking for it. here yeah you don't get it it's okay but that's what Mulaney Mulaney does a great job of making this audience comfortable and laughing with his laughing with him at his flaws yes whereas me the stranger it they probably felt like they were laughing at me right and maybe that's why i didn't get it like but like i'm always obsessed with why a joke doesn't get the laugh and then i start getting into the science of the syllables and vocal mm -hmm. inflections and all of that shit stan hope is a god at that nobody really talks about him enough yeah but Doug Stanhope, Wanda Sykes too. Doug Stanhope and Wanda Sykes do a really good job of playing with word inflection. Mm -hmm. Where on paper it's not a punchline. Yeah. But if I say it like this, yeah. Now that might be a punchline. Right. The delivery of it. Yeah, there's just something to both of them, you know. Wanda on the punchline, Doug gets laughs on the premise. He gets more yeah. laughs on the premise than a lot of comedians that I watch. Which is well, like he's so much he's so imaginative. Like I think it's some he's somebody who 
literally is like, I'm not going to, he's not going to bring you some bullshit premise because it's not just below his standards, but he's, he's seen it all. So he's, he's, he'll just not, he's not going to tour. He's not going to get up without something to say. That's how he's always struck me. Here's a question about stand up that I think you could, you're closer to the ground on this than me. The comedians, the comedians that we know who mm -hmm. have audiences that have opinions about not being vaccinated, right? Mm -hmm. How do those or where do those comedians tour if we get into vaccine passport land? Um, well, they're just the, those, those with like the strongest feelings about it. Like if, especially if they're just like, I'm not into it. Um, I, I well, think like they won't. The comedy club. Well, so, so, so I was, um, I was in San Francisco at Cobbs and they announced, and this wasn't per me, this is per the state of California. Hey motherfucker, yeah. you coming in here, you got to fucking show and prove and blah, 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 blah. Yeah. And someone in the, in the tweet replies was like, does this also apply for Doug Stanhope? And they were like, Yes. And my first thought was, huh, I, I do wonder what his take is on the vaccine in general. But also, he doesn't strike me as like his audience is probably 50 50 on that shit. Mm, interesting. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. So if you're a guy like Stanhope and you want to sell the most tickets, where do you go? What do you do? Not everybody has a fucking farm where they can just pull a chapelle and put folding chairs in their backyard <laughs> and beckon the neighborhood. To cut, well, I guess in LA they could. Well, you're in Austin. You probably could set up some chairs. I guess you could. Yeah, you could find a place here to set some chairs. But <laughs> and you know, and it's warm enough in the winter. Yeah, you could do the outdoor shit. weren't y'all doing outdoor shit in Austin most they, of the winter? I wasn't here for that yet because um, I only moved here a few months ago. But yes, they were doing they were doing outdoor shows. Yeah, uh, I, I think, think Theo Vaughn and I think Hinchcliffe weren't they like the beachhead for like a lot of the LA guys that came out. I mean, I don't know. I mean. I remember that that Chappelle and Rogan were doing outdoor shows here. They were doing it yeah. um, pretty regularly, uh, and and audiences were coming out. You know, they were testing people too. They were doing like rapid tests for people. You know, they I'm were, not doing that shit at my show. That shit is expensive as fuck, bro. Yeah, well, that's Dave and Joe. So, but yeah, I mean, I think at, at a certain point, I yeah, just have a do with Q-tips to intimidate you, but it really ain't. <laughs> <laughs> he really ain't put he ain't testing the shit he ain't testing <laughs> makes you think you tip you tell you yeah. to stand to the side then 10 minutes later he just go oh right, you good you good man uh you're like people are like god damn what how much did you spend on putting the show on you're like how much like, I'm just now i'm just now getting into yonder bags for some of my shows and i'm not even doing yeah. that for all of my yeah. shows yeah that shit is so expensive i did it for a couple it's a lot it's really prohibitively expensive but i would only do it in special occasions yeah i think yeah. yeah i did it in new york a couple times but i do it more when i'm hosting a room to make the other comedians feel comfortable so yeah it's a better show yeah but if it's just my show and it's just me yeah yeah i don't my, my comedy's not nobody's going and leaking it like most of my fans they appreciate the preparation process or whatever yeah i think it's cool when you do i've, I've had to act on that only a few times but i think most fans that come out to shows know that you don't want that shit leaked You're not helping anybody out mm -hmm. um know. look before uh you go i wanted to uh remind everybody again um, obviously we know we can see you uh regularly on the daily show but roy's job fair can be downloaded wherever you get your podcast and you're yeah. also you're also putting videos up on youtube yeah, we throw up a couple of videos, like, you know, two, three times a month. We're not a full production situation like you, like, yeah. you know, like you boys do. But uh, when it's something funny that strikes us, we'll throw it up there. Well, we just had on a bunch of women, speaking of OnlyFans and porn, we had Lisa Ann on. We had a bunch of women who, like, break. Like there's, We spoke with a woman who just sells her used panties on Craigslist so and, dumb. like, just makes, just makes bread. Yeah. Just and makes bread. But then... I don't want to hear that anybody's struggling. That's a woman that's attractive. That's not selling oh, her it. fucking panties and her socks and her shoes. The fuck is wrong with you? Get online and sell that shit. We can't keep acting like pussy sells itself. They're still marketing. And get a website. Go to squarespace.com. Get a website. 
Okay, you believe that if you want. Go on Pornhub right now and see one of them 80 view videos. Some woman took your word, my pussy is enough. And now she's out there for the rest of her life with 83 views. Yeah. Because <laughs> she, she didn't take a Gary V class. Yeah. You gotta fucking learn from Gary V. You do have to market yourself. That's true. Your pussy's not enough. You have to market it right. But, but no, it's a fun podcast, bro. Like we, we just spoke with a NASA scientist uh, two weeks ago. Uh, next week, we have a full episode about the cannabis industry and, you know, people that have broken through in that. And yeah, companies I love that are it. Hiring and all of that shit. Right now, we're trying to find this is going to sound weird. We're trying to find this is not weird. Racist. This is going to sound OK. How can I not sound racist? Yeah. <sighs> So in Mexico right now, and this is a real thing, in Mexico, okay. because of American avocado consumption, avocado farmers are starting to ha- getting shut down by local cartels Jesus. for their avocados because avocados are as valuable as cocaine in certain what? parts of Mexico. Because, it, yeah, because it's just a, it's a profitable piece of produce. So to keep from being shut down by the cartels, avocado farmers are hiring private security guards to guard avocado fields. So I'm trying to find an English speaking avocado security guard who will come on my podcast. Put it out there. You know what they're looking for. So we can talk to him about this job. Like how do you get hired as avocado security and what does that job entail? Yeah. And what do you do when cartel fucking security shows up? That's what, and so those are the questions we get into. It's weird jobs, curious questions, I love shit it. like that. So if you're a, if you're a bilingual avocado security guard, <laughs> holler at me, and I mean that in the least racist way possible. Where do you go from there, uh, Roy? Apparently, Wood, to the notes app to type my apology from that silence <laughs> you just made. <laughs> That's where I go. Dude, thank you for coming on, man. This was this was really fun, for real. And we're going to get that. Eh, ese tipo de que trabaja con los aguacates de seguridad en México, que lo llamas nomás a, a Roy Wood. Okay, nos vemos. I, I hope you really said some shit. And didn't just get me caught up in something. Bert and Tom, Tom and Bert. One goes topless while the other wears a shirt. Tom tells stories and Bert's the machine. There's not a chance in hell that they'll keep it clean. Here's what we call Two Bears, One Cave. No scripts, a bit of booze, amateur partology. Dirty jokes, raunchy humor, no apologies. Here's what we call Two Bears, One Cave.